tonight, an investigation into the overprescription of powerful pharmaceuticals. They're dangerous drugs. Concern over how they're being doled out and the consequences. Severe anxiety, can't sleep, waking up, cold sweats, balance problems. Now a move to track some doctors prescribing them. They say someone broke into their luggage and stole thousands of dollars of valuables. You feel like they've just basically just violated you. Locks were cut, luggage was open. The calls for airlines to do more. And at issue. What is the full and final cost of a Rive scam? The unknowable cost of the ArriveCan app. Will the Liberals pay a political price? From CBC News, this is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with a Radio Canada enquête investigation that is highlighting growing concerns about how some powerful and common medications are being prescribed in this country. Benzodiazepines and drugs like them are popular. They're used to treat many ailments, including anxiety and insomnia. But patients and doctors warn long-term use can invite disaster. There's a risk of becoming dependent. And as Alison Northcott explains, some worried doctors aren't considering the consequences. When James Dean Trepanier was prescribed benzodiazepines for pain after surgery, he says his doctor told him nothing about the drug he was taking or its side effects. I had like 30, and he says, you won't be taking it every day. So when you come back and if you need more, well, I'm going to give you more. And He did get more and ended up taking the pills on and off for eight years. When he later quit, he says the withdrawal was unbearable. Severe anxiety. Can't sleep. If you go to sleep, I'd go to sleep and I'd hear like gunshots in my head, waking up, cold sweats. Radio Canada's investigative program Enquête spoke with 12 people who had similar negative experiences with benzodiazepines or hypnotics. These medications are also called sleeping pills, anti-anxiety medications. Um, Experts say while the drugs can be effective to treat those conditions in the short term, some warn they're being overprescribed and used for long periods of time and that doctors and patients don't always know the risks. There is a need for public health leaders and um, health ministries to um, put attention towards benzodiazepines because they are behind a number of health uh, issues. Those can include falls, fractures and addiction. Gagnon says about one in 10 people in Canada has been prescribed a benzodiazepine or hypnotic at some point. Among seniors, it's one in four. They're dangerous drugs and so they never should be prescribed uh, long term. Despite warnings like that, the drugs are sometimes prescribed for years. They're meant to be used for days or weeks, says this expert, who has helped people get off benzos safely to avoid dire symptoms of withdrawal. One of them is uh, what we call akathisia, uh, just uh, severe restlessness and inabil inability to sit still. We don't have any treatment for that. It's, it's just a horrible feeling. Allison, can you walk us through what's being done to cut down on this problem of overprescribing? Well, professional orders in some provinces have issued guidelines and standards. Alberta's College of Physicians and Surgeons says the ideal duration for benzodiazepine prescriptions is three to seven days. Nova Scotia's college says initial prescriptions should be limited to two to four weeks. Now here in Quebec, the College of Physicians says that it's starting to keep track of which doctors are prescribing these drugs the most. And it says that's not to sanction them, but it wants to know who they are and to work with them to make sure that they understand how to prescribe them safely. All right, lots of people will be watching this. Alison Northcott in Montreal, thank you. Now to another exclusive, an Ontario family's cautionary tale, just as many Canadians are thinking about flying south. They say valuable items were stolen from their luggage, and as Thomas Degg shows us, they want the airline to take responsibility. And this was a great day. Lisa great day. and Dave Parsons returned from their son's wedding in Jamaica with plenty of good memories. Amazing, amazing. And one nasty surprise. Locks were cut, luggage was open, luggage was a mess, um, everybody was frantic. About 40 family and friends made the trip from Toronto Pearson International Airport, spending the week soaking up the sun at this five-star resort on Jamaica's north coast. So many places to choose from. All of it booked through Sunwing, 
A dream vacation to be sure. Until several travelers got home to find their luggage cut or damaged with thousands of dollars worth of electronics, watches and perfumes missing. It was very visual to everyone, the luggage in the, at the resort, so we know that it wasn't tampered with it. That could have only happened, they say, at the airport in Montego Bay. Using a locator app, the Parsons found their lost earphones still pinging from a neighborhood in that city. We asked the airport who hires the baggage handlers. They told us the airlines do. Sunwing is who we paid our money to, so I feel they're the ones that need to be step up to the plate. Brian Williams was also on that trip. It's, I think, the principle of them going through your stuff where you think it's safe. When you feel like they've just basically just violated you. This traveler's rights advocate says Canadians are entitled to compensation in the event of such thefts, but just how often passengers are robbed is hard to tell. One thing that CAA has actually been calling for for years now is more publicly available data. What we'd really like to see is how many claims are going into the airlines. After CBC News reached out to Sunwing, the company told the travelers the incident is being investigated by Jamaican police. The airport told us, as far as they know, thefts don't happen often. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. A renewed push tonight to protect new parents who lose their jobs while on parental leave. Right now, people in that situation often don't qualify for EI. But as David Thurton shows us, that is being challenged both in Parliament and in the courts. Katie Bose returned to work after maternity leave, only to be laid off but she hadn't been back long enough to qualify for employment insurance. It didn't seem fair at all. I mean, I had the right to take that year off and to spend time with my baby. Without a second income, her family remortgaged their home. I just have hope that sharing my story can impact uh, the government to make these changes. Changes the NDP is also calling on the government to make. We have a responsibility for to young families and to all of the children who uh, they care for to do better. The party wants benefits extended for people laid off on and shortly after parental leave, helping those who have used up their hours while caring for their child and have not worked enough to requalify. Six Quebecers are before the federal courts fighting for this as well, alleging the government is discriminating against working moms. By denying women these EI regular benefits because they've received EI, uh, maternity and parental benefits, these women are experiencing blatant discrimination. In question period, the NDP criticized the Liberals. New moms shouldn't have to cannibalize their EI benefits to get a mat leave, and the government shouldn't have to wait for a court order to do the right thing. So when are these Liberals going to get the job done and end this discrimination against women? Mr. Speaker, I appreciate my colleagues' advocacy on this important issue. We have spoken about the ongoing work of modernizing our EI system, and our government continues to make progress on this. The Liberals have been promising EI reform for years. With the NDP holding a balance of power in this parliament, they will continue to use their leverage to try to push for change ahead of a spring budget and the next election. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. Two women are dead and a third seriously injured after a mass stabbing in a Montreal suburb. And my daughter phoned crying and she said, uh, get out of the building, there's something going on. Police, firefighters, paramedics raced to this apartment complex just before noon. They say the stabbing took place inside one of the buildings. We had five resources here, uh, plus our advanced care paramedic team was here. Uh, unfortunately, as, as we came in, uh, the firefighters were already uh, trying to CPR on two of the victims. The suspect, a 44-year-old man, was arrested at the scene, also taken to hospital. Police are not saying what the motive may have been. And investigators say they now know what led to that deadly shooting at the Super Bowl celebration in Kansas City. There was no nexus to terrorism or homegrown violent extremism. This appeared to be a dispute between several people that ended in gunfire. One person was killed in the shooting Wednesday. More than 20 others were injured, the youngest just eight years old. Police say two minors are currently in custody, but charges haven't been laid and the investigation is still ongoing.
to the Middle East now, where Israel says it's launched a, quote, precise and limited raid of the largest still functioning hospital in Gaza. But as Sasha Petrosik shows us, scenes from within the hospital depict destruction, chaos, and panic. Smoke and panic fill Nasser Hospital, the biggest clinic still operating in Gaza, refuge for some 8,000 Palestinians, and now under attack by Israeli forces. Dr. Mohammed Harara describes the chaos on social media. Israel army trying to enter Nasser Hospital now. Ordered to evacuate, patients find no safe escape. People is uh, so scaring that uh, will be killed. One woman on dialysis finally flees. They fired rockets and bombs at our heads, she says. This sensitive operation was prepared with precision. Justified, says Israel, because Hamas militants used the hospital as a base. Rescued Israeli hostages spoke of it. Indicating that Hamas held hostages at the Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis, and that there may be bodies of our hostages. As Israel prepares to launch an all-out attack on the city of Rafah, the hospital's chaos is exactly what many fear on a huge scale. More than a million displaced Palestinians are tightly packed here with nowhere to go. An evacuation to a safe place in Gaza is an illusion. The UN warns there could be a stampede on the Egyptian border with mass casualties, something many in the international community have pushed Israel to avoid. We are continuing as a country the steadfast focus on bringing forward peace. Canada's joined with Australia and New Zealand to amplify the warning. Our message to Israel is listen to the world. Do not go down this path. Israel's plan to continue military operations in Gaza until what it calls total victory. Sasha Petrusik, CBC News, Toronto. The White House has now confirmed reports that Russia is developing weapons in space that could attack satellites. And CBC News has learned that Canada has been briefed on this. But as Katie Simpson shows us, the official stance seems to be concern, not necessarily alarm, at least not yet. It sounds like the plot of a science fiction movie. A Russian weapon system launched into space with the ability to target and destroy enemy satellites. Russia is trying to make it a reality, according to U.S. officials, who say they've been tracking developments right for months. First, this is not an active capability that's been deployed. And though Russia's pursuit of this particular capability is troubling, there is no immediate threat to anyone's safety. The White House did not confirm reports nuclear weapons are involved. It does say Russia's goal appears to be knocking out communication systems, including satellites used by the military. Russians have long thought that if they're losing a war, uh, an effective way of trying to level the playing field is by degrading that space-based architecture for collecting and transmitting information. But this nuclear policy expert says this kind of Russian program is nothing new. And when Canadian officials were briefed on the matter, a senior source tells CBC News it was not seen as a reason to panic as there is no pressing danger. All of it prompting questions from some lawmakers about why the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Turner, published a short cryptic statement about this issue in the first place. I worry that the motivation to uh, draw so much attention to this is less about intelligence and national security and more about a politician who wants to send $60 billion to Ukraine. That is the exact same argument made by the Kremlin, which accused the U.S. of fabricating the threat to drum up support for the stalled Ukraine aid package. To those allegations, the White House was blunt. Uh, what's, what's your reaction to that claim? Bollocks. The senior source briefed on the matter tells me if what the U.S. flagged with Canada and allies ever becomes operational, it would be alarming. And while they're taking it seriously, it's not viewed as an urgent matter. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Donald Trump will be the first former U.S. president to face a criminal trial after a New York judge denied his request to dismiss the hush money case and set a date next month. The case is based on allegations that Trump took part in a cover-up of payments to adult film actor Stormy Daniels 
before the 2016 election. Trump has pleaded not guilty. It's the first of the four criminal prosecutions against him to proceed to trial. This one begins March 25th. Food additives that are banned or that get a warning label in other countries can be found in Canadian snack food aisles. A marketplace investigation shows some manufacturers are creating two versions of the same treats, one for this market and another for Europe. Rosa Marcatelli shows us why that has some people worried. Let's stick that candy in the cart. Marketplace ordered some popular snack foods from Europe. Okay, it's here. To see how the same products can have very different ingredients, depending on where you live. Lots of good stuff. We compare them to the ones sold in Canada, scouring labels for some controversial ingredients. Allura Red, also called Red 40, Tartrazine, or Yellow 5, and Sunset Yellow, FCF, or Yellow 6. These synthetic food dyes can cause or exacerbate neurobehavioral problems in some kids. So what that means is that they can cause things like inattention, hyperactivity, sleeplessness, restlessness, irritability, these sorts of things. In the products we order from Europe, we find some get warning labels about these dyes, but others don't have the dyes at all, unlike the Canadian versions. Then there's another additive used to make food look brighter, titanium dioxide. It's not in these foods from Europe, it's banned there over concerns it could cause damage to DNA. The fact that it has this potential to damage the DNA material is not something that we should intentionally add to, to food. But here it is in the Canadian versions. We take that to parents. It's shocking because obviously these companies, parent companies are global. Why are they producing on purpose two different sets of products? We're no different than people in Europe, so uh, why is it that we have different content of the products? I think it's, it's a great question for Health Canada. Health Canada tells us they've reviewed these additives and found no conclusive scientific evidence that they're concerned for human health. Marketplace asked the companies behind the snacks why they make different versions of the same products, given the controversy about the additives. The companies tell us their products are safe and follow all government regulations. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Toronto. You can watch Marketplace's full investigation Friday. It airs at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television and CBC Jam. An update now on a story we brought you last night. It's about federal contracts awarded to GC Strategies, the private IT company that worked on the ArriveCan app. Last night we reported it was awarded $239 million in various contracts since 2015. That was based on the government's own online database. But the government now says there are some duplicate contract entries, so the number's lower, although it cannot say what the total amount is. The fight between Alberta and Ottawa over climate change is becoming more heated and more personal. I wish you would put Stephen Guibault in your crosshairs. So I'm trying to get him fired, and I would love your help on that. So what does Guibault have to say? But it's not the Minister of the Environment running on a, a cabal. The fifth estate gets reaction from both. <laughs> Prince Harry slides headfirst into a second day in Whistler and... <laughs> Toronto Raptors show Spicy P some love. No matter where he looked, he was going to see it. We're back in two. Lincoln, you may miss him, but that was Prince Harry taking a turn on the skeleton track in Whistler. It's part of the second day of athlete training for the first ever winter Invictus Games. Wounded veterans from all over the world will compete here next year. Now, before all that happened, Lindsay Duncombe hit the slopes at Whistler to catch up with members of the Ukrainian team for the Invictus Games. They are hoping to inspire their fellow soldiers at home still fighting a brutal war. This is just the second time Sergei Hrapko has sit skied. He's getting the hang of it. Hrapko will represent Ukraine at next year's Winter Invictus Games in Whistler. Wounded servicemen and women from around the world will gather to compete in adaptive sports. Through a translator, he describes the experience. It's complicated to uh, like explain the emotions, the feelings. At the moment when uh, Sergei can feel to control uh, and 
за, за, за ски, басикли. Таке якесь відчуття свободи, реально. Так. So it's a feeling of freedom. Rapko was injured fighting Russians in 2015. There was heavy shelling. His left arm blew off on the battlefield. His left leg was amputated above the hip joint in hospital. Sport has been key to his recovery. But when the full-scale invasion began in Ukraine two years ago, Rapko's focus changed. From that moment, I aware that uh, it's uh, no longer be uh, about my own goals and feelings. He regularly visits wounded soldiers at hospitals in Kyiv. For the Ukrainian team, participating in the Invictus Games is a way to send a message home to the soldiers still at war. Invictus for me uh, shows that uh, you really could feel happy, full of life, uh, no matter what condition of body you have, and stay of mind. Just to feel joy of life and uh, pleasure of movement. And being here is a chance to remind people from all over the world about the war in Ukraine. It's very terrifying war, scary war. And the world is uh, like, need to help us. When Hrapko returns, he plans to take fellow wounded soldiers to mountains at home, show them how to ski, sharing that feeling of freedom. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Whistler. Alberta's premier and the environment minister are at odds, and it appears neither is letting up. He's going too far. All about trying to score cheap political points. What they told the fifth estate. And Rosie in the Ad Issue panel will also take on Gilbo tonight. So hey there, Rosie. Hey, Adrian. But first, we're going to talk about the app that costs a lot of money that no one really knows how much or exactly what the company behind the contract actually did. There are direct follow-ups, uh, investigations ongoing right now. Chantal, Althea, and Andrew join me to talk about that and more. Three, two, one, ignition, and liftoff. So that is the Odysseus lunar lander, nicknamed Odi, launching into space today. Odi is on a mission to be the first U.S.-made spacecraft to touch down on the moon in five decades. A landing attempt is scheduled for February 22nd. The political battle between the federal government and Alberta is heating up yet again after the environment minister's controversial comments on roads were met with intense criticism by Premier Danielle Smith. The fifth estate has been digging into the pair's fraught relationship, and as Susan Ormerson shows us, it appears to have reached a boiling point. This is wild. Thank you. When Tucker Carlson landed in the oil patch last month, he aimed his arrow at the Prime Minister. There is zero evidence that the Trudeau government loves you, and there's overwhelming evidence that they hate you and your families. Premier Daniel Smith. But joining him on stage, Alberta's Premier had someone else on her mind. I wish you would put Stephen Guibault in your crosshairs. So I'm trying to get him fired, and I would love your help on that. Danielle Smith is locked in a brawl with Stephen Guilbeault over Ottawa's climate agenda. Everything from capping carbon emissions to curbing natural gas use. Their battle is heating up both sat down with the fifth estate. He's going too far. Um, he's asking us to do things that are unachievable. And I'm, I live in the real world. I think she, she feels that she has to pretend she cares about this issue of climate change. It's not about facts. It's, it's all about trying to score cheap political points. Alberta is key to Ottawa's plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But the Premier opposes nearly every move directing her province how to do it. I heard you say that you've asked his cabinet colleagues to rein him in. Yes. Do you sense that there's a division in the cabinet about Stephen Gilbo? I hope there is. That's not what I said. And that was before Gilbo's misstep this week, saying the government won't fund roads. The minister clarified his, uh, uh, his comments that he was speaking about a very specific project in Quebec City. You said we had all the roads we need. Under pressure, Gilbo says he and the climate mandate have full support. It's not the Minister of the Environment running on a, a cabal by himself here. It is supported by, by, by the Government of Canada. Still? Well, absolutely. 
The next six months are critical. He has to finalize regulations on clean electricity and the emissions cap. Premier Smith is not backing down. No emissions cap. As long as they continue to invade our jurisdiction, we're going to see them in court. If not before, at the ballot box. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. You can watch the full episode of Boiling Point Climate Chaos Friday night at 9 p.m. on CBC Television and GEM, or you can stream it on the Fifth Estate's YouTube channel anytime after 1 p.m. Eastern. So Rosie and Ad Issue will tackle Gibo's comments and much more. Now it is time to break down the week in politics. At issue this week, the Auditor General says not even she can figure out how much the Arrive Can app actually costs taxpayers. She says there has been a glaring disregard for the rules around contracts. The opposition wants answers. This app was supposed to cost 80 grand, said the Prime Minister. Now it's at least 60 million, but we don't know for sure because of missing documents. The government is promising them. There are direct follow-ups, uh, investigations ongoing right now, both internal and external, to ensure uh, that as rules were evidently broken, uh, there are consequences, there is an accountability for this. How damaging is this report for the Liberals? Does it speak to a larger issue around procurement and outside consultants, something we've talked about before? Hello, I'm Rosemary Barton. Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj here for At Issue to break it all down. Good to see you all again. Um, this does have sort of uh, flashbacks to times we've talked about outside consultants in the past. Um, this one, uh, this particular app happened, of course, during COVID, but we've since found out that this company has also received many other contracts um, and, and perhaps with some questions. Andrew, why don't you start us off here on what, what you make of how significant this is and what it tells you. Well, we don't know what it tells us yet uh, in detail because even the Auditor General, as your piece off the top said, couldn't get to the bottom of you know, what things cost, et cetera, because no records were kept of uh, what the money was spent on, who signed off on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's a little too quick for people to jump and say, well, the problem here is because they used external consultants. The problem isn't that they used external consultants, it's that they had no competition, no oversight, no records, and there may well have been, we'll find out, rather too cozy relationship between some people on the inside and some people on the outside. That's not uh, outside consultants, that's just either some com combination of, of incompetence and graft. Yeah. Uh, so th uh, it's distressing in particular to see the Conservatives basically parroting the NDP on this and saying you should be doing everything with, you know, unionized public servants. Um, what you should be doing is following proper procedures. The larger question, it seems to me, is uh, if this is the culture within certainly that agency, uh, is it the culture more broadly? How widespread is this practice, for example, of these multi-layered bidding process where somebody just takes a, a cut off the top for introducing you to somebody else. Yeah. Um, is there similar lax controls and lax record keeping? That is certainly worth looking into mm -hmm. uh, because certainly we found that, that uh, the, this particular company, GC Strategies, was getting a whole lot of different business, not just this particular ArriveCan app. Um, so wider questions should certainly be asked, but let's be careful and clever about how we ask them. Yeah, there, it, it's potentially hundreds of millions of dollars, although the, the CBSA and other departments came back to us today and said, we don't exactly know how many because there's so much overlap. We'll try and get you a clear a clear number. But just so people understand, that company was sort of the matchmaker, right, between the government and the IT companies that, that could do the work. Chantal. And uh, since it has had a variety of contracts, one has across a variety of departments, one has to assume that there were instances where work got done. Sure. Uh, otherwise, wouldn't a department tell another department, stay away from these guys? Yeah. Uh, they're not Maybe. going to bring you what you, you're asking <laughs> yeah. for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that being said, <clears throat> I mean, $80,000, that was the original estimate for the yeah. cost. Yeah. Everybody understands that things happen in IT, but not to the point of uh, building a bill to 60 millions without anyone saying, wait a minute, what in the world is happening? Yes. So yes. a couple of points. Uh, I, I am with Andrew on the notion that the public service should not be doing everything in-house. But what this tells me, I mean, this company basically was a go-between. Mm -hmm. They got the contract. They had a list of providers, people. They subcontracted the contract that they'd been subcontracted. Okay, fine. 
But it seems to me that over the years, there is no one left within the public service who can actually look at a, a, an estimate mm -hmm. and yeah. say, this mm -hmm. is reasonable. Yeah. Uh, and if we are flying blind in IT, I'm curious to know how many millions of dollars have gone out the window. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of Pierre Poilievre's point too, Althea. Like, why is there no one in government who can either do the work or at least have a sense of what the work might cost? Mm -hmm. Well, that speaks to even bigger problems yeah. about the public service. <laughs> I don't know that we want to spend the next 50 minutes talking about how to reform the public service. Um, <laughs> but I agree. I think there's two things we need to separate. One, I think there are legitimate questions to be asked about who knew what, when, and what they did about it, because that, yeah. to me, is still not really clear about when the political side was told. Mm -hmm. And even just below the political side, when senior public servants were warned about this, because if it didn't trickle up to the top, then it makes you think that this was the norm. And to Andrew's point and Chantal's point, then that talks about larger questions and bigger problems that need to be investigated. I'm not sure that the records were not kept. I think we also need to be open to the possibility that the records were deleted. Um, I also think back to the consultancy problem, you know, these two folks or three folks originally who started this company, um, they spoke to the Ottawa Business Journal, I think, uh, several years back about yeah. how they came up with this idea for their company. And they said, you know, the government's uh, contracting process is very onerous. And they're right about that. And But that is something that the government can do something about. It, mm. If you're a small company and you're just two people who are actually doing work, maybe it's not worth the trouble to go for a $10,000 contract yeah. or a $20,000 contract. But the government can do something about it. Yeah. There's no reason yeah. why public servants are not keeping the list that GC Strategies was keeping to try to find That's suppliers right. to do the work. And the yeah. other question yeah. is, you know, should you be just hiring someone who is a matchmaker and then hiring, you know, three or four levels of subcontractors to do the work and you're not verifying to make sure what's happening? Uh, there are way bigger questions to be asked. It feels like we've just kind of scratched the tip of the iceberg. And I want to yep. say here that um, Andrew's colleague, Bill Curry, has done some fantastic work on this yes, file yes, for the past several yep. years now. Yeah, he's been on it long before the rest of us were. All, yes. all, 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 all props to him. But in in terms of like the app was happening during COVID, everyone agrees every, the government was scrambling trying to figure things out. But but how much of this does the government have to wear, Andrew? Um, it, whether they knew or not, or were involved or not, like how much of it is about a, a political damage for the government? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, we talked about this question of the culture. People, obviously, within that agency, within that department, either thought this was okay, or if it wasn't okay, thought they weren't going to get caught. Either way, that speaks to something wrong in the culture there, particularly when it's, you know, more than, you know, more than one person involved, when it's the, something as widespread as it, as it seemingly uh, was in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, th well, who sets the culture? The person at the top does. That's why we have ministerial responsibility. It's not because ministers directly made yes. the mistakes yes. or committed yes. the acts that are involved. Chose it's the because, company. Yeah. It's yeah. because yeah. if they pay for it with their jobs, they're going to make it their business to know what's going on in their department and make sure that the culture is right rather than wrong. Right. And clearly that didn't happen here. And I don't think they should be allowed to get away with saying, as they have on so many occasions in the past, well, it was just a few bad apples in the public service. We've got a whole lot of bad apples, it looks like to me. Chantal. Well, if you believe that you can get away with having a project that started at $80,000 end up at $60 million, you're either uh, not very clever or else uh, this is common practice. Mm -hmm. And we don't know that. Okay. I, I would say... You know, I understand LTS point that we shouldn't go into what's happening to the public service, but at some point we should go into what's happening to the public sure, service. Sure. A succession of clerks of the Privy Council uh, went through the top civil service job over the past decade, uh, and these issues have been building up, and the performance of the public service has been going downhill in all kinds of ways. So, yes, I agree with ministerial responsibility, but at some point, someone is going to have to answer for how do we fix this. Yep. Yeah. Because yeah. if you can't deliver a passport, if you can produce apps for 60 million, and no one seems to know why this happens, go down the list. Well, then, what in the world are you doing? And do we really expect a politician to be able to fix this? Uh, unless the top levels of the civil service are doing something about it. La last minute to you, Althea, if you can bring it back to the politics and whether you think there's an impact there. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying 
I don't want to talk about the public service. No, I just me didn't too. Think we it's had just enough an, time yeah, it's another segment. Minutes. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about the yeah, public yeah, yeah. service. Um, but yeah, to bring it back to the government, I do agree with Andrew. The tone is set at the top. Uh, the reason that contracts get increased larger and larger, and you see this in provincial governments and municipal governments, is because they can add on to contracts, which is another thing they should disallow, and some things that we're seeing the government move on now. But I don't think it's enough. I don't think the answers the government has given is enough. What bothers me is they yeah. don't even seem that angry about it. Right. Um, this is taxpayers' money. It's a sacred trust, and you hope that the people who are in charge, yes, it's the pandemic, and yes, you know, things had to go out the door, but you're hoping that the people at the top set a tone and the expectation, and that trickles down. Sure, and clearly sure. people are not afraid enough uh, that they're doing things that are grossly improper. Can Andrew, then Chantal, and then I got to go. Yeah. yeah, one last point. Yeah. It, it's $60 million is a lot of money. Yeah. It is one one thousandth of just the cost overrun on one part of the national shipbuilding strategy, right? The, the, the 12 frigates are going to cost, the latest estimate is $84 billion. The original estimate was $26 billion. Yeah. We've got procurement problems much larger than this, but it starts, you know, if you don't get after these relatively smaller ones, you're never going to deal with the larger ones. Chantal. Uh, two points. I'm not going to use the numbers from the Phoenix pay system overrun <laughs> uh, and the calamity that it has been. Yes. Uh, but. Uh, the scary part is if the government doesn't look concerned, I don't think it's because they are not scared of what the hit that they're taking. Yeah, I yeah. think it's because they have no answers to provide. Yeah. I, I that's maybe yeah. worse. Okay, I, I'm going to take a break. I'm, I'm really glad Andrew did that math so we didn't have to. When we come back, we're going to talk about Stephen Gilbo's now clarified remarks about roads. We still have funds, obviously, to maintain uh, and, and enhance our, our, our road network across the country. He now says the government will, in fact, pay to build roads after, suggest after suggesting it would not. Does this complicate an already difficult week for the Liberals, as we've been discussing? That's next. The Minister of the Environment is trying to clarify his comments after he said the federal government would no longer invest in new roads. It's not what I said. Yes, it is. Wait, I have to read it back now. What, what, what I have said is that the solution to our transport challenge has by many different things, including massive investment in public transit. Stephen Gilbo admits he should have been more specific and says Ottawa would not back any large projects. So how will these comments be used against the Liberals? Let's bring everybody back. Chantal, Andrew and Althea. Althea, I'm going to start with you. When you have to clarify multiple times and you end up with something that didn't sound anything like what you said at first, it's usually a bad sign. But uh, is this damaging or, or just like a gaffe that Stephen Gilbo made? Well, it's damaging for people who uh, already are not prone to like Stephen Gilbo. So I don't really think that there is a huge... <laughs> Um, uh, a huge damage there. You know, all the premiers are jumping on it. People who are convinced that Stephen Gibo is an environmental activist who is out of touch will believe, latch on his comments to believe that he's an environmentalist who's out of touch. <laughs> I do think that uh, Mr. Gibo basically said the quiet part out loud. A lot yeah. of environmentalists, and it seems like many people around the cabinet table, believe that if you build more roads, you encourage more cars, and that the government should not be doing that. And instead, it should be in investing in public transit. And I think that that's what he meant to say, his clarification about, oh, I was really talking about the troisième line. I wasn't in the room, so I'm not sure if that was yeah. the segue or not. But um, it does seem like a little bit of a stretch. By the way, he is not wrong to say that if you build more roads, it leads to more cars. That is true. But not everyone in this country lives in an urban area or even in an urban corridor. It, it really doesn't help with the urban rural thing that the Liberals are constantly not having to deal with. Okay. Chantal, yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a reason why this story never got picked up in French okay. anywhere. Go ahead. I'm sitting about a couple of kilometers from the Champlain Bridge. It links Montreal to the South Shore. It was built by the Liberals. The and he didn't say out loud uh, what, he, what they really think. For six months, every single Quebec federal minister has been telling the Quebec government that they will not be funding the third link to Quebec City unless it has a public transit yes. component. Yes. That is so not news that his biggest error was to not complete the sentence, possibly for having said it so often in French that it, it kind of became a given. That being said, before we go into this, he wants to force people in the countryside to take bicycles and walk 
kilometers, possibly with uh, no shoes because they're... Um, guess who pays for roads in this country? The majority of roads are fin financed by municipal and provincial sure. governments. Sure. The federal government gets involved in major projects, the Confederation B Bridge, the, uh, the Champlain Bridge, but it is not the federal government that decides that they're going to give two lanes to Highway 50 no, between Ottawa no. and Montreal. No, so but you, you, would agree that, you would agree that it's not a great thing for him to say. I, I would agree <laughs> that he never realized that he was saying what people are making him say. And mm -hmm. that is the reason why it was such a non-story in a place where there are, there are people, plenty of people who would have liked to write that uh, Stephen Guilbeault was depriving Quebec of a third link because he wanted everyone to not have access to, to highways, except that that is not the reality of the policy of the government, which has been the same yes. since 2015. Andrew. Uh, we have over a million kilometers of roads in Canada. Uh, to judge by the response, you'd think the minister proposed to rip up all of them and we'd have no roads because people are running around saying millions of Canadians won't be able to get to work or, or take their kids to school as if he proposed to get rid of the roads. He's not. He's proposing to withdraw federal funding uh, for uh, new road construction. Yeah. Well, first question any fiscal or constitutional conservative would be asking is why do the feds need to be involved in uh, road building at all? That is a, a quintessentially local or provincial matter. Uh, it's true that federal except governments... For Trans -Canada except for Trans-Canada. Except for things like the Trans-Canada. But generally speaking, and, and the fact that federal governments have gotten themselves involved for political reasons over the years doesn't mean that they have to be in eternity. And he's also absolutely right to say uh, um, if you build a lot of roads, you don't fix congestion. By the way, building a lot of transit doesn't fix congestion either. You don't fix conge congestion until you get at the root cause of it, which is that we give away scarce road space for free. We don't charge to use the road, so instead we allocate them through time. That is to say, the people who get to use the roads are the people who are willing to sit in traffic for hours and hours every day. Uh, that's a really inefficient way to do it, but one of the consequences of that is anything you do to try to just quote unquote make the traffic move faster, build a lot of roads or build a lot of transit, yeah. yep. all it does is reduce the time price of driving and lo and behold, as every study confirms, people respond by driving more. So no, building new roads is not the answer to congestion. It may be the one that every politician prefers to talk about, but if you notice, none of it has actually reduced congestion. Qu quickly, Althea, and a last tiny word to Chantel. Althea. Andrew is right, period. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said that. Now we have to just end the whole panel let's, that you said that. Okay, let's Chantel. Let's just preserve that <laughs> tape, shall we? Um, last word, Chantel. I am with Andrew on this, but yeah. uh, that being said, uh, and again, I say it, the federal government not only should not, but does not finance the majority of roads yeah. in this yeah. country. Yeah. It's on the government of Canada's website. It's called journalism to check. I was hoping that he was about to announce flying cars a la Jetsons, and that was what I was holding on to. Anyway, thank you all for that uh, good conversation this week. We'll see you back here next week. And with that, I'll throw things back to Adrian, and she, of course, is in Toronto. Thank you, Rosie. Next, a sweet surprise for a former Raptor. To Toronto! His warm welcome home in our moment. This may look like a scene out of a movie, but in fact, it is section 119 at Toronto's Scotiabank Arena last night as the Raptors took on the Indiana Pacers, nearly everyone wearing the same jersey, number 43, for Spicy P. Pascal Siakam was recently traded to the Pacers, but Raptors fans made sure to show him love on his first game back. The touching surprise is our moment. Let's welcome back Spicy P. Pascal I think it made all fans a little bit nostalgic, just getting a glimpse into the past. Last night, the Indiana Pacers played the Toronto Raptors. Pascal Siakam was traded to the Indiana Pacers, which is like why last night was very special because he was coming back to play in Toronto for the first time as not a Raptor. There was a deliberate effort to really make it feel special. The Raptors organization bought all of Section 119, a brand new Siakam jersey. They had a row of probably kids aged six to 12, all with Siakam jerseys in front of the Pacers and in front of the Raptors too. So basically no matter where he looked, he was gonna see it. He basically stopped for every single one, which is, you know, that's him. And like, even when he was shooting free throws, normally the away team players are getting booed. He got some boos, but a lot of it was still tears, which was nice. 
I really do just love how he is true to himself. Not only that, but he's kind of homegrown, growing from you know a bench player to a role player to a, an all-star, and of course an NBA champion. So when Pascal Siakam was traded from Toronto, he wrote a love letter to the city, and he said when he was a rookie during the anthems, he would look into a section like 119 to see if he could find a jersey, maybe one, maybe two. So last night, they wanted him to see nothing but a sea of jerseys. From all of us at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.